Welcome to One Word Stories, episode 14. Today, I'm really thrilled to host a precious guest from Kenya, from Nairobi, Elizabeth Maloba. Elizabeth, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. And I'm really honored and privileged to be invited to be your guest today. I'm so happy you've got time and uh, energy to join. And yes, uh, Elizabeth in three words uh, is uh, definitely a passionate diversity, inclusion and equity professional. She's a highly skilled facilitator and a moderator. And she's involved in many, many projects uh, around the world, actually, <laughs> working with, uh, yes, uh, of course, themes as diversity, inclusion and equity, and also with uh, stories. So I'm really, really thrilled to hear from you, to learn from you uh, how actually working with stories with diversity works in the African context as well, in Kenya particularly. Uh, what is really fantastic is that you got, got nominated for the award East Africa Come. So congratulations. Uh, it's for the technology uh, professionals. And the focus is actually how to use technology uh, to uh, drive economic growth. So Elizabeth, tell us more. Who is Elizabeth? This is, I always say this is a composite question because there's the question of who am I being, the human being, Elizabeth, and the doing. And, and many times people ask this question or when they're asked this question, they immediately jump to the doing without getting to the being. So I am increasingly aware of that. And I would like to start by talking about the human being, Elizabeth. And I struggled to find my identity for a long time for, for various reasons. But I think I finally arrived at a place where I can say that I am an explorer. I am a seeker. I am an inhabitant of the edge of the border of the regions. We have a Kenyan athlete, uh, his name is Eliud Kipchoge. He said, uh, I don't know where the limits are, but I would like to go there. And that resonated a lot with me. This is, this is who I am. I like to go where the edge is, where the limit is. And one of my favorite quotes is by Edward Teller. And he says, when you get to the end of all the light and it's time to step into the darkness, Faith is knowing that one of two things will happen. Either you will be given something solid to stand on or you will be taught how to fly. So this is really at the core of who I am being. This is what resonates with me as a human being. What do I do? I think you already started talking about it. I'm a facilitator. Uh, I work in cross-sectoral, transprofessional, multi-stakeholder, those kinds of, you know, where there are too many different people at the table. Uh, settings, uh, mostly to foster collaborative initiatives and mainly because would like to change things, would like to change processes, would like to change strategies, practices, or even sometimes systems. Yeah, I love your focus on being before doing, you know, because especially in uh, the professional context, very, very often people are more or less reduced to this one story. What uh, do you do for a living? And uh, many, many times, and especially right now during the COVID-19, uh, people uh, are not only forced, but also willing also to change careers and not to be reduced just to one profile, one job description, one uh, professional identity. But as you have said, and I can relate to your description uh, a lot, just uh, to learn how to fly, to try out the different things. And um, you are actually one of the pioneers uh, in this field because when uh, you decided to be the entrepreneur and uh, to be uh, self-employed 2001, you are actually um, somebody very, very unique in Kenya, weren't you? <laughs> well, yes, this is partly true. So 
I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My dad is an entrepreneur. My mom is an entrepreneur. Again, very strange for their times because in the 70s, it was more 60s and 70s. It was more that you got a job than, than you were self-employed. And I always knew that I wanted to be self-employed. I remember in high school, I, when we were doing the selection of the courses to study at university, we had a career advisor and I went for a session and I specifically asked, which course do I have to study if I want to be self-employed? And she said architecture, which is how I have a degree in architecture, even though I don't practice. So this is a story I always tell, especially young people. I tell them, listen, what you do in life might not even exist at the time you go to university because at the time that I went to university, facilitation did not exist as a professional field. You could not study for this. You could not learn this. Everything I know will I learned by doing and experimenting uh, after my university degree out here in the real world. So in that sense, yes, I, I learned how to flat. I'm, I'm kind of right out there saying, but let's talk about bringing stories into the work. I'm talking to a friend of mine who's a musician and asking how can we bring music into the work? How can we bring art into the work? What is it from this fields cross disciplinary interdisciplinary that could come and enrich the work of facilitation that would enable communities and groups to make decisions that are valuable to transform in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful, because especially right now, when we don't really have so many impulses uh, we used to have because of, you know, travels and uh, contacts with people on the regular basis, uh, we need to activate our five sentence, uh, senses, don't we? So what you are just addressing uh, with music and arts, uh, it's really wonderful way just, you know, not to reduce uh, ourselves uh, to, again, just one way of working, but also inspiring and uh, blossoming uh, also in this virtual uh, context, just because we add different possibilities to learn and to also communicate with each other. So what was your highlight uh, in the COVID time? I have a friend who framed it perfectly. She said COVID is the time of local content. So my highlight of, of, of COVID is I'm finally local. Before COVID, um, on average, I would spend 10 days a month away from, from my house, away from my family, away from everything, because that's how facilitators work and we go to where the client wants us to be and I remember at the beginning of last year I was on my way to I actually went to Mexico City I got to Mexico and I said you know this is the last time we're meeting face to face and this particular client said no it's not going to be that bad we are going to we had I think a few more sessions planned they are going to take place one of our sessions was in Milan so you can imagine <laughs> this didn't happen yeah, yeah <laughs> my project in Milano got cancelled as well. Yes, we moved and it and right? and it was something to 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 know that I'm going back to Nairobi and then I'm going to be in Nairobi. So I've tried out quite a number of uh, home away from home options during COVID. I've, I've I've used Airbnb quite a bit and tried out different places just to also get the feeling. What's the difference between me living in my apartment in Nairobi and working there? versus living in a farmhouse and working there. So it's it's been a really good experiment and experience in connecting to the local, to being grounded to the community. Mm. What I hear uh, is that you love experimenting. So this is, <laughs> this is really fantastic that you're also very proactive and you are, you know, uh, creating your surroundings so the doc lockdown didn't really uh, limit your uh, ideas how to uh, still remain active and try out different things and uh, what i'm asking myself is what is actually the word that uh, supported you in this situation in 2020 and also right now i think the big change was sharing space actually yes that was a big change sharing space so you notice i have a, a virtual background behind me and the reason i do that is behind me is my son sitting in at his desk uh, uh in remote school 
and also next to him is my husband sitting at remote work and we have to balance this space we have to balance how we share it who's on a zoom call at what time when can you speak mute your microphone get sound uh what did we we had to get uh, microphones that are noise cancelling mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so the big change for me was sharing my space because normally everybody used to leave and leave me working in this little office by myself mm -hmm. yeah um what was the word that kept me uh resilient uh i ended up with the word uh luya and for those who are kenyan they'll immediately tell you what did you choose the name of a tribe so yes this word also is 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 it gave the tribe its name but Luya is a word in the Luya language uh, that means, in general, direct translation, it's a fireplace, a hearth, a place where people came to gather to speak about the events of a day, tell stories, um, and whatever else they wanted to discuss and make meaning, collective meaning, uh, out of their day-to-day -day events and occurrences. But it's also an identity because you get if if you came to this gathering and you were new, they asked which which Luya do you come from, which Luya do you belong to, and it's it's also a process and a way of doing things. So for me, this is really the word that got me through this because it's my community. It's I went to my community. I found a place. I. In the family, I, I started family Zoom calls and now they're family Google Meets. In my household, I started like theme days. So on weekends, we have uh, home decoration Saturday, you know, or gardening Monday, something like that. I went to my community to make meaning out of what we heard, to get support, to talk about the events and occurrences and how they were impacting us, which was different also. And it was exciting and interesting to see how it was different for my son, for my husband. Um, it was also a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of fun to be sitting and working in this little space next to each other, because now we know a lot more about what each of us does. Uh, so sometimes uh, I'll be having a conversation. Uh, I shared a photo, uh, uh, an artwork with you, Dedo Elizabeth Bell. I got that from my son. Wow. Um, thank you. <laughs> you can tell him thank you from Joanna. <laughs> I shall tell him. Yes, I was just laughing when you mentioned the title of the picture your son uh, came up with because actually Dido and the uh, heroine of the portrait painted by David Martin was a real black beauty uh, from the former uh, British colony and uh, her name was Elizabeth just like yours and uh, this uh, really amazing portrait from the 18th century is uh, the very first one that shows two women of different colors in the equal way so they both of them they are shown in really beautiful clothing uh, reserved for the British aristocracy. So I was so intrigued by it that I started to research after our conversation and found also this amazing movie that was based uh, on the picture. And um, yeah, it's uh, really a spectacular spectacular story because actually diversity inclusion equity we are talking about it's nothing new <laughs> i'm sorry to say so but this is really a shame that in the 21st century we still talk about something that is so obvious what is your perception in your context particularly in kenya so one answer to that question is we're very Eurocentric. And so diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially in the corporate world here, but also in most day-to-day uh, -day conversations is very much about gender. Uh, it's also about young people, youth. So this is a big thing for us on the continent, uh, but it, it makes sense. We have a large youthful population. so. How do we include young people? It's about people living with disabilities. Um, there's 
a taboo one, which is the LGBTQI community. So that's that's kind of still taboo around here. Um, and so on. So that's one one microcosm of a, of a discussion. And normally, I think the quick shortcut to go to. But I always tell people, Africa is in the world, and the world is in Africa. And and we are black. We can't escape it. It's the skin in which we live. And um, Black Lives Matter is 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 a reality, even though we are predominantly a black continent. So I live in a country where we are predominantly black, most people are black, but somehow white people have more privileges than black people in, in our social structuring. It's a legacy of colonialism, but it's there. We, we still have this. Um, and so in that sense, we resonate also a lot with, with, with the American movement for, for Black Lives Matter and so on. And I think I have a South African friend who said, oh yeah, but then it had to be the Americans who said Black Lives Matter before Black Lives started mattering. Mm -hmm. So that, that tells you something again, whose voices are heard, whose voices are not heard. Um, so in that sense, diversity, equity and inclusion has many dimensions when I work on it. One of the most exciting ways I'm now working on it and talking to people about is algorithms. Welcome to my world. I love science, I love maths, <laughs> and algorithms. And we are increasingly living in a world that's managed and determined by algorithms, increasingly. And with COVID, multiply that. And yet, we don't think about who makes the algorithms and what power do the algorithm makers have in choosing who to include and who to exclude, what's in, what's out. So simple examples I love to give is if you're playing any one of these computer-based or phone-based um, games and you have an avatar, the white male avatar always is superior to, you especially do not want to play as a black woman. Like really, pick your characters if you want to win, you're, you're, you're white and you're a man. It's very rare that you're black and a woman. And there'll be something about the black woman that, 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 that burdens her, that makes it impossible for her to win in the same way that the white man wins. This is a game, computer game or phone game. It's, it's interesting to see those kinds of things. Um, I think we also talked about it uh, when we had the course with you, when we were talking about what is skin color. Mm -hmm. And then you have this, um, in my life, uh, microphones, right? I need, ideally, I should have one that's skin color, then it would blend and then it would disappear and then it wouldn't be so, you know. But what is skin color? The skin color microphones are very pink, mm -hmm. if I can find one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there are all these ways and means where diversity, equity and inclusion uh, dimensions that we don't think about, but that are important. Another important one within my context, I would say for sure is tribe. So um, you talked recently about borders and I like to tell people I am a border. Me, Elizabeth, I am a border. Two tribes come together in me and every process in my life has had to be negotiated on that basis. Are we going to do it the Kikuyu way, the Luya way, or the neutral way? Mm. Which way are we going here? Which language should she learn to speak first? Mm, Kikuyu, mother, Luya, father. Hmm, English, we went with the neutral one because then we couldn't fight too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it, this, this, this whole constant negotiation of what is the majority, what is the minority, how do we include both? What is the safe option? <laughs> mm. What is the option that's going to take work? <laughs> Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so this, this, this different dimensions exist even in my context. So tribe is a big thing, for example, in Kenya. And you would think a country with 43, at least 43, I think it's now 47 tribes, shouldn't have a tribal issue because then, I mean, how do 47 tribes fight against each other? But we do, we have the in-tribes and we have the out-tribes. We have the marginalized communities. We have the ones we think are backward and then we have the ones we think are really modern and savvy and up to it and of course it depends on who you are and where you stand so again with these discussions what do i bring to them 
who am I and what am I bringing to this discussion? That's also <laughs> part of a context. It's a work in progress. We have to work because sometimes um, you find yourself opening your mouth and a stereotype comes out. Um, for example, it once came out in a conversation, somebody said, well, uh, the Kikuyus are thieves. And then those of us with any kind of Kikuyu blood were like, do we continue this conversation? Do we shut up? Because um, my mom is Kikuyu. Mm. You're my family, but my mom is Kikuyu. So, and then it's like, oh yeah, but not, not your mother. And you're like, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a constant process. It's a constant negotiation. It's a constant finding a way together of how do we navigate this tribal conversation. And the tribal conversation is, uh, I think the word my friends uh, in, in, in development use is it has been instrumentalized in this country, uh, especially for political power and political power play. Uh, but also for economic power. And it's, it's, it's really kind of like our tinderbox. So when everybody else is talking about race, what I look at in this country is tribe. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, when you were nominated for the Is Africa Come Award, uh, what was the first thought in your uh, head? Was it okay? I really, you know, this uh, person who is fighting for uh, equality between men and women, or I really this person who is fighting for the inclusion of men and tribal voices, or what was the very first thought you had? What uh, uh, the diversity and inclusion and equi equality you identify yourself with? So <laughs> First, we have to start with what went through my head. I was like, okay, this is the latest prank by some internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to verify everything. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I verified it. <laughs> but that was the first thing, like, what? <laughs> and I think the second thought in my head was somebody sees what I am doing? I didn't realize this. I'm just going ahead, doing my usual business, doing whatever it is that I do. And how is it that somebody saw this and identified it and thought, ah, yes, she's doing something important. Um, which kind of diversity and inclusion did I most closely associate with that award? For me, I, my go-to is inclusion of young people. Mm -hmm. My go-to is really inclusion of young people. Um, I come from a family where we were included as young people. And this is not the norm mm. within the overall general cultural context. But in my family, if you, I mean, you, you are expected to have an opinion and you are expected to speak up. Do not speak unless you are spoken to. Yeah. This was not how I grew up, even as a young person. We, we were given a voice. We were given a space to express ourselves. We were involved in multiple conversations. In, in, this, in this word that I gave you, in the Luya, in my family Luya, mm -hmm. everybody, even children, had a space and a time to talk and, and a voice and an importance, and it was listened to. And as we grew up, uh, people made an effort to try and find some way for you to fit in the community, to contribute to the community, to be part of something. And I find that this is really missing in our overall context as, as countries, as um, a continent. We have a large youthful population, but we kind of have the attitude like, Oh, there, there's high unemployment among young people. Yeah, yeah. Let them create jobs for themselves. I'm like, what kind of abdication of responsibility are we now spouting as leaders that we want them to create jobs for themselves? I mean, somebody created jobs for us. Somebody made space for us. Mm -hmm. How can we make space for them? And why don't we hear what they have to say? I always remember my grandfather. <laughs> there was a huge controversial discussion going on and the young people had an opinion 
the parents had a different opinion. And then my grandfather said, you know, um, we, the older people, we're going to die and be buried and we're going to leave this to these young people. So it might be worth it to listen to what they want because that's what they're going to be doing after they bury us. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is really, I think, the part of inclusion that really resonates with me. How can we create a space for young people, give them a voice, give them agency, uh, create opportunities for them, let them have possibilities, stop creating an entire generation of young people who are hopeless. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I can relate to it a lot because, uh, you know, when I have also classes with uni uh, with the students at the different universities, um, this is also part of, of the process, so to say, just to create the space that they can share different stories. And uh, one of the stories is really, I'm stuck. Yeah, so when you talk about this hopeless uh, attitude <clears throat> this is definitely something that uh, needs to change uh, so that people also uh, see the possibilities they have perspectives and you are very very right with uh, emphasizing that they cannot be overwhelmed with creating everything on their own yeah, because yes, they, they simply can have fantastic ideas, but need this kind of support. Definitely, yes. So what uh, is your role in supporting this young uh, persons? How can you support them? What I try and do a lot is bring the voice to the table. It's not always easy and many times I fail. And especially, I especially fail when I take on the role of their spokesperson because then what am I speaking about? <laughs> I'm mm. not a young person anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I find the most successful is when I actually bring them in person and then they can bring their own voices uh, themselves. Um, so that's one way I do that. I, I bring their voices to the table. The other way I do that is I offer mentorship and I do this actually on a pro bono basis for young entrepreneurs. So for, for other entrepreneurs, I would charge if I, if I offered mentorship as a, as a paid service, I would charge. I don't right now, but I do offer mentorship for young entrepreneurs as a pro bono uh, service. And I have learned a lot from these young people. My God, everything I know about technology, they taught me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy about technology and latest developments and so on, but oh my God, you know, <laughs> how to get like, what you're using a small space. Okay. So you need uh, noise canceling microphones. What, what are those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're going to be having a conversation. You're going to need to edit it. This is the software to edit it. Mm -hmm. How does that work? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> so it's actually also this reverse mentorship. Yeah. The reverse mentorship that is also included in many, many programs in the corporate world. So mm -hmm. that finally we need to acknowledge, and I, I love this idea that there is this mutual learning from mm -hmm. one another, yeah? not mm -hmm. on top down or the senior teaches something the junior, but also uh, other way around and vice versa. And this is how learning works in general. When we talk to, to each other for the first time, you emphasize also how important storytelling is actually in the African context, that it's um, just, you know, the way of being then we come back to this uh, distinguishing between being and doing. Uh, what is the biggest treasure for you uh, while working with stories in this uh, tribal context? One of the things I find working with stories, so in, in the different tribes, we have different stories, folk tales, if we can call them that. And one of the things I have found working with the stories in the different tribes, um, and also I work with this also with a Zimbabwean friend of mine called Patrick. Um, he has a website, mitupo.org. And we work with proverbs and stories and, and similar narratives, uh, ways of making meaning in different African communities. And one of the things we find is that actually um, 
there's it's same same but different mm -hmm. there's a lot of same same but different um i think obviously as i said i'm a border i'm, I'm sitting right there in between two tribes so every time something comes up in my dad's tribe i'm like mom do you have this in your tribe <laughs> and everything comes up in mom's tribe i'm like dad do you have this in your tribe and so i have lived my life comparing the narratives what is a narrative for birth? What is a narrative for naming? This is a very interesting story. My my grandmother, my mother named me according to the tribal practice of her people, which is to name me after her husband's mother. In my father's tribe, you don't name people who are alive unless you want them to die. Oh, okay. Aha! So my name was a navigation. <laughs> This is the, the story. We had to have a story here. Hello. My grandmother was like, no, 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 you have to change her name. She, This is the new name I want her to have. We have to change it. My mom was adamant. I'm sorry, but in my tribe, it's a mark of honor and respect that I name you. So she's keeping the name Elizabeth. <laughs> and I think a teenage, my grandmother said, I'm so glad I accepted to let you keep that name because I have something that, that, my ancestors before me never had, which is I know the person who bears my name. Mm. And most of the ancestors before me, they didn't know the person who bears my name. But with all this tribal work, I find those stories, those are the ones that, that make us, you know, cross the bridges. Um, we will be sitting somewhere and the usual stereotypes again will arise. Um, about communities and we always laugh in my family and say so in this United Nations we need to for example we're going to a meeting and we need food and we're like we are called the lawyers they're the ones who are going to tell us how much food we need to cook and which food to cook they're the food experts and then it's like and please call the lawyers because they're going to tell us what to wear <laughs> <laughs> they're the fashion expert they're like the trendsetters when it comes to fashion and style <laughs> You know, and then, oh, we're going to need the Kikuyus because we need to discuss money matters. And those are the guys who can manage our money and budget for us, you know, like, so it's it's a standing joke in my family, but it's it's a really new narrative and it's, it's a fun narrative <laughs> to have uh, to say, yeah, but what we need, we need music. So get XYZ community. I find that story work, especially this new emerging transformative stories, they're really useful and valuable in, in, in enabling people to navigate. And more and more, so in my generation, I was an aberration. There were not many people who came from two, whose parents were from two different tribes. Mm -hmm. In my son's generation, that's the norm. Mm -hmm. Most people have parents from two different tribes. Yeah. So more and more people need these tools to navigate that conversation. How do we navigate the tribal conversation? Uh, do you need to speak both languages? Exactly. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, uh, mm. which name should we give you? Mm. And why? Should all the children in this home have the names of one tribe as if the other tribe doesn't exist? Yeah. And in, in taking the father's son name, we take the father's tribe. Mm -hmm. And so what happens to my mother's tribe? Mm. So those, those, um, but story work has been really useful, both in the creation of new stories, but also in looking at the stories from the past and comparing, working with the stories of the past to see what, where the commonalities are and working with this, trying to come up with stories of the future, which, which are more about where do we merge? What do we want to be? What, what, what choice are we taking in this situation? We have a situation. We, so which choice do we take? Exactly. And what I hear also very, very often from you is just to make the best out of it. Yeah. So really, it's about compromising, but also laughing together. And uh, yes, a little bit of improvising and just, uh, yes, uh, agreeing, okay, this is the story we want to live in, so to say. So Elizabeth, 
Thank you very, very much for sharing with us lots of stories uh, from different aspects of uh, diversity. I appreciate the conversation a lot. It's really, really uh, very enriching because, you know, it opens also new perspectives, uh, how to work with stories, especially in the diversity, inclusion and equity context. So I wish you all the best for all your projects. I love Thank your you. Thank you involvement in the mentorship program so lots of learning and lots of joy oh yes and lots of failing together and laughing at ourselves together exactly. and co-creating stories for the future yes yes <laughs> and spreading hope thank you oh yes much. always spreading hope there's always something to smile about and we have to find a way to make sure that everybody can see that thing whatever the thing is for them yeah thank you thank you very much thank you joanna i really enjoyed talking with you